Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Thursday of the Summer School on Carbon-Free Combustion. Today, uh, we will have two parts. In the morning, we'll mainly talk about... <coughs> Oops. <laughs> we will talk about the chemistry of uh, carbon-free combustion. And uh, this afternoon, uh, we will have the lab tutorials. But uh, help me in welcoming uh, Professor Perrin Pepio from Cornell. It's really my great pleasure to welcome her here. It's the first time she's coming in Saudi Arabia and um, at KAUS. So um, I'm really honored to have the chance to attend her lecture on uh, chemistry. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. It's my, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm really enjoying my time. Uh, it's, uh, it's a new experience for me, and that's, uh, I like new experience. Uh, so I'm an associate professor at Cornell University. Cornell University is in the, in the middle of nowhere in the, um, upstate New York. So when we say it's New York, it's not New York City. It's kind of far from New York City. Uh, you drive any two minutes in any direction, uh, you get fields of nothing. Um, but we have a university. Uh, my area of expertise uh, is in the uh, integration of chemical kinetics into CFD, um, uh, especially uh, the, the uh, large-scale CFD simulation. So my uh, research uh, interest is really centered around uh, how we can uh, put as much chemistry as we can in CFD simulations so, get, so that we can get the right dynamics uh, from it. So I really work at the interface between chemical kinetics, uh, computer science, and fluid mechanics. I'm writing algorithms most of the time. Um, but then uh, a lot of my work has to do with model reduction. Uh, so the more complex the chemistry is, uh, the better. So there's uh, two consequences to this. The first, the first one is that I'm not really a chemist. I, I understand chemistry through the equations that result from the chemical mechanism, so through the dynamics of it, and how that impacts my CFD code. Uh, so uh, that might be different from uh, some of you who are really chemists and working on detailed chemistry with quantum chemistry and, and fancy experiments and, and methods. Uh, the second point that might be more relevant to this talk specifically is um, everything that I do contains carbon because I like complex chemical systems. So the more carbon there is, the more complex the system is. Uh, so uh, it kind of doesn't really fit this uh, concept of carbon-free combustion. Uh, so you are going to see that I'm going to sneakily, sneakily uh, move away from carbon-free combustion uh, and... Um, produce the, com the, the uh, context of carbon neutral combustion. Uh, and, and to do this, uh, I don't look at the fuel itself, um, because the fuel is not carbon, uh, carbon free. But I'm expanding the boundary of my system, I, uh, including the fuel production into the system, so that overall, I'm getting close to uh, having a talk about carbon neutral combustion. Uh, so for this, um, for this talk, I needed a scope because uh, I have only a limited time, uh, and I needed a context. I, I needed some, something relevant to talk uh, to you about. So my, uh, my scope is, in my title, I said solid fuel conversion processes uh, for near-carbon neutral combustion applications. I'm going to replace that by um, liquid fuel production from biomass uh, conversion, uh, thermo thermochemical conversion of biomass. So really, I'm going to focus that uh, solid fuel conversion into uh, the biomass one. Um, the reason why I'm doing this is because, uh, first, I have a little bit of experience with it, uh, but also because it's a, a summer school on combustion. Uh, and there's very nice parallels that I can draw from biomass conversion techniques, or how we model those techniques, and uh, the combustion world, so how we model combustion processes. So I want to... Uh, put those two in parallel so that you can see that indeed it's the same thing. I mean, the same techniques, the same processes, the same models, ideas. Um, the, uh, oh, and then uh, if, um, if you look at, what did I do? I don't think I touched anything. Ah, and I did it. Yeah. 
All right, and uh, the second part, so I needed a scope, but I also needed to make sure that this scope was relevant to you. Uh, and if you look at the past 20, 30, 40 years, um, when we talk about uh, biomass thermochemical conversion to biofuel uh, or to some liquid fuel, uh, there's not a lot of applications that stuck. Uh, there's obviously the uh, corn to uh, ethanol that is obvious um, and is uh, detrimental to, to, to the process. But in terms of uh, commercialization, in terms of uh, widespread uh, conversion processes from biomass, there's, there's not a lot. So um, I needed a context, I needed an application to tell you that yes, it's still relevant. And uh, that's what I'm gonna uh, start talking about. So in that context, uh, anybody remembers that uh, kind of brutal um, first page of The Economist? And the, the title is kind of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, shocking. It might have been uh, before you even started thinking about uh, studying combustion for your uh, grad, uh, grad school. It was 2017. So the death of the internal combustion engine, it had a good run, uh, but the end is the site for the machine that changed the world. Uh, and that had, uh, this cover page had somewhat of an impact in the US because, uh, especially in my group of friends, uh, because we were in the middle of writing proposals for a program, a massive program from the U.S. government called the Coptima program, which was, can you guess, internal combustion engines and how you can uh, co-optimize the fuel and the engine uh, for it. So uh, it turns out that uh, the U.S. government might not have been really uh, foresighted. Uh, the economists might have had a little bit more um, intuition about this. Because if you follow the news, um, internal combustion engine is indeed on the way down. Uh, so from the US perspective, uh, the Biden administration at the beginning of the year announced that they would be phasing out uh, internal combustion engines uh, by a long time in the future, uh, 2050, I think. Uh, and um, so I see engines operating with conventional petroleum fuels. Uh, and the, uh, on, closer to here, the European Union uh, nearly was that close to pass a law, uh, phasing out completely uh, the IC engine, new NC engines uh, uh, sales in the, um, in the European Union by 2035, so like 12 years from now. Uh, but Germany changed their mind, and about a month ago, um, they decided to amend it uh, so that uh, IC engines uh, functioning on e-fuel still, would still be allowed to, um, to be sold. But that uh, gives you a bit of context. Uh, it tells you that uh, ground trans transportation doesn't look like a great customer for liquid fuels, even if they're coming from biomass, because they're supposed to be phased out. Um, on the uh, air transportation side, however, uh, things are different. So it's, a, it's another story. The, just to give you a few numbers, the worldwide aviation accounts for 2% of all human caused CO2 emissions and 12% of all transportation emissions. So um, there's been a lot of movement uh, in aviation recently. Uh, the first one is the International Civil Aviation Organization has capped the net CO2 emissions uh, from aviation uh, to the 2020 levels all the way to 2035. So uh, it's uh, on a voluntary basis, but all the countries, basically all countries uh, agreed. And the aspirational goal, so again, it's not mandatory, it's not low, uh, but they aim uh, at net zero carbon emission by 2050. So uh, this, those, uh, uh, those decisions happen in the context of growth uh, for the um, aviation industry. Even after COVID, it's starting to pick up again. Um, they, uh, right now, we are consuming 106, 106 billion gallon commercial jet fuel market. Uh, sorry, we are consuming 106 billion gallon commercial jet fuel, and this is uh, projected to nearly double by 2050. So, pop quiz. How many liter is a gallon? Because pesky US people don't use SI units. Gallon? At the US. Yeah, 3.78, I think. Pretty close. 
Uh, so roughly four liter, uh, just to. Uh, <laughs> Is it? Uh, all right, so, so that's a lot of gallons. Uh, that's a lot of liters of, uh, of fuel. Um, so the question is, uh, how, we, how are we going to, uh, to do it? And uh, if you look at uh, pure zero fuel uh, options, uh, it seems like you've been hearing about hydrogen and ammonia, and both of them are generating a, a lot of interest. Uh, but with hydrogen, obviously, uh, somewhat uh, clearly ahead of the race. So uh, to the point where aircraft manufacturers have started planning for test flights uh, of uh, gas turbines and fuel cell technology operating on, uh, on hydrogen. So, question again. If you paid attention, uh, why do you see, what do you see as a major challenge for aircraft running on hydrogen? Storage tank, yeah. Because hydrogen is not uh, volume down, uh, energy, it's... Energy density is really low compared to, to the uh, fuel that um, aircraft has been designed for. Uh, so what do you do? You compress it. You decrease the temperature as much as possible, and you end up with cryogenic uh, storage tank, very well insulated. Uh, what is the best uh, shape for a cryogenic insulated compressed tank? Uh, spherical is not that uh, convenient. Next best shape. <laughs> it's a cylinder, right? And obviously that makes sense. Uh, if you've ever uh, gone to a laboratory, what you see are cylinders of compressed gases. Um, guess where the fuel is usually stored on an aircraft? The wings. Uh, so we have a little bit of a... Um, uh, Cylindrical peg into a, a square uh, hole kind of problem. Uh, so that's what the engineers are going to be working on. And that may explain why Airbus decided to take the A380 as uh, their test, um, test aircraft. That may not be the only reasons, but uh, at least they have a lot of space uh, to put their, um, their stuff. So the cylinders are going to go inside the, uh, the fuselage. And what they're doing is not replacing one of the turbines uh, with their uh, experimental um, hydrogen uh, turbines or uh, fuel cells, uh, but they're going to mount it on the side of the fuselage. And um, because the aircraft is kind of big, it's very stable, uh, it can handle it without any problem. So uh, there's uh, two uh, technologies currently under consideration. One is a gas turbine operating on hydrogen. And the other one is, um, so gas turbine operating uh, on, uh, on hydrogen would be a jet, uh, jet engine type uh, system, so it would not change the, um, the type of uh, uh, performance, or it would uh, have limited impact on the type of performance that you get uh, from your engines. However, switching to um, a fuel cell, uh, you're not able to maintain a jet engine anymore. Uh, so what you do with your fuel cells is you create electricity, and from the electricity, you, uh, um, uh, you rotate a motor, and the motor is uh, rotating a propeller. So you switch to a propeller type, uh, type system. Anybody knows uh, why? Uh, so what's the difference between um, typical uh, performance or range or endurance between um, a jet engine and a propeller? Yeah, that, that's exactly true. Uh, is there a reason for this? So one of the reasons, so, so propellers are really efficient. They're more efficient than, than jet fuel, that, uh, jet engines. Uh, but propeller are limited in terms of the velocity they can uh, operate at. So they're typically um, kept for smaller aircraft, smaller distances, because they can't go as fast as uh, jet engines. So, um, that is uh, planned for 2030, uh, 2035, I think, uh, 20, 2030, uh, in, the, in the near future. 
Uh, and when, uh, when you ask uh, think tanks like uh, McKinsey in, in the US uh, what they think about hydrogen, what they will tell you is that they expect that uh, hydrogen is going to penetrate the aircraft market, the aviation market, by the end of the decade. And starting uh, in 2030, it's going to ramp up. Um, and by 2050, should perhaps get about a third of, uh, of the market. So hydrogen is definitely going to be a big player. Uh, ammonia is more on, on the, uh, behind for now. There's a lot of more problems with, with ammonia. Uh, but it's also, uh, th there's a lot of studies started uh, on this. So one third is covered by uh, carbon free, free fuel. Uh, what, for, uh, what, uh, what happens for the rest? Uh, for the rest, we don't have a choice. Uh, we need to have a carbon based fuel. But we want to be smart about it. Uh, push the boundary of the system so that it becomes carbon neutral, uh, and we want to, um, to use a sustainable aviation fuel. So we want to use a fuel that when you burn it, you basically have net uh, neutral emissions, if you include how you produce the fuel. So those are called sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF. And that's uh, what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, few minutes. So what is SAF? It's a liquid hydrocarbon fuel produced from renewable or biomass waste resources uh, with, and you want that fuel to have exactly the same property as your petroleum derived jet fuel. Uh, so that it's completely compatible with existing aircraft engines, it can be uh, blended with existing jet fuel, and it can be considered a fully drop-in fuel. Uh, same, uh, same infrastructure, same everything. So uh, SAF are just one, um, uh, one option of uh, synthetic, or one version of synthetic fuel. Um, so I'm just going to uh, uh, define a few, uh, a few expressions here so that uh, we are clear on what means what. So what I call uh, synthetic fuel is uh, any single mixture of hydrocarbon molecules produced by a sequence of chemical reactions to synthesize the fuel from a feedstock. Uh, rather than a uh, selection of your hydrocarbons uh, through a distillation process uh, from crude oil. So SAF is a synthetic fuel, uh, but we have other types of synthetic fuel. Uh, we have e-fuels. So e-fuels, so that's actually uh, an interesting story. It started in the US, uh, electrofuel, uh, but then uh, in the 20 years, um, fracking started. And fracking created a lot of natural gas. So the interest for electrofuel went away because they had all those cheap uh, natural gas to work with. Uh, to the point where uh, the first time I heard the word e-fuel was actually by Professor Sarati last year. And I was like, what is it? <laughs> um, but it started in, in the US. Um, so uh, what is an e-fuel? It's a synthetic fuel manufactured from capture CO2 and H2 obtained from sustainable electricity sources such as wind, solar, or nuclear power. Uh, the uh, additional, the optional term or the, the alternative term that you uh, sometimes find is power to liquid. So what uh, is key to an e-fuel is the fact that there's no carbon whatsoever except from the feedstock, the CO2. Um, do you know how you produce e-fuel? What are the two steps? What are the steps that you need to produce e-fuel? So you start with CO2 and H2. Oh, let's say you start with CO2 and power. So you electrolyze the water into H2, yeah? Yes, you get CO from CO2. How do you get CO from CO2? What would be the uh, most logical option coming from a combustion scientist? There's this reaction that's called water gas shift reaction, and we want to do it in the reverse direction. And does it proceed just naturally? It's not exothermic. The water gas shift is a bit. It's endothermic, yeah. So, so you need uh, help. And so it's typically using catalysts to, uh, to do it. All right, so now you have CO and H2. What do you do with those? How do you do methanol?
So what kind of process are you using? So methanol is just one option. Um, let's say that you want a SAF fuel. Yeah, you would use a fischer tropsch uh, process that um, basically creates CH2 building blocks and uh, put them one after the other using a, a catalyst so that you can get uh, mostly alkanes from it. And, but there's various types of fischer tropsch uh, type process. All right, uh, another term that I want to, uh, to define is biofuels. Uh, what is biofuels? It's just liquid fuels produced from renewable biological sources, including plants and algae. And there's one uh, slight um, distinction that I want to make is uh, bio-oil. So I will treat biofuel and bio-oil as two different things. I will say that bio-oil is a biofuel obtained from the fast paralysis of biomass. So uh, also called paralysis oil or bio-crude, and I will come back to this process a bit later. And then the last one that we need to define is syngas. What is syngas? A mixture of hydrogen and carbon monoxide in various ratios, depending on how you do the... Uh, um, the production, you can get different type of uh, ratios. And this typical and intermediate step for hydrocarbon fuel synthesis, typically using fischer tropsch uh, processes. So, just to make sure that everything is in order, uh, biofuel, e-fuel, uh, SAF are synthetic fuel. Syngas is used as um, uh, a feedstock for synthetic fuel, and bio-oil is just a subcategory of biofuel. Um, and SAF can be obtained from biofuels and e-fuels. All right, now that everything is clear, um, why am I talking about uh, SAFs? SAFs? I don't know how you pronounce it here. Uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Um, so uh, it has become uh, quite present in the, um, uh, in the discussions for for combustion systems recently. Uh, so first in the US, uh, there's uh, from September 2022, uh, the um, government released this uh, Grand Challenge Roadmap uh, with very, very ambitious goal, goal uh, to achieve. So from 3 billion gallons, or liters per gallon, uh, per year of domestic uh, use of SAF, uh, they, so they, they want 3 billion uh, gallons per year uh, of SAF domestically uh, so that they can reduce by 50% the life cycle greenhouse gases emissions compared to the conventional uh, jet fuel, and that by 2030. Uh, and they want 100% uh, SAF use by 2050. So that's a pretty uh, fast ramp up of the use of fuel that doesn't come from the ground in a refinery, uh, but come from something else and potentially a refinery. And what uh, kind of distinguishes this uh, initiative to, compared to others is the fact that it's a close collaboration across multiple agencies, all the three letters agencies I can pick of, except the big ones, like FDS, yeah, yeah. Um, but DOE, uh, the uh, Department of Transportation, the USDA, uh, four letters. Um, so all of them are, um, uh, are working together to make that happen. Uh, and they also include non-governmental not government organization and obviously uh, the industry. Uh, and uh, it's a very, very comprehensive, uh, comprehensive plan. So they cover everything from feedstock innovation, uh, conversion technology, building supply chain, policies, uh, enabling end use, uh, so how you get the fuel to the airport, uh, and uh, communication and building support. So it's a very, very comprehensive, uh, comprehensive plan. Uh, the one part that I'm going to focus more uh, in this talk is really conversion technologies. So that's the, the US side. But again, uh, it feels like they're, they're working together for once. Uh, the uh, European Union uh, did not want to, uh, to stay behind uh, and is actually looking at doing the same thing in a slightly different, worded slightly differently. Uh, but it's, uh, so it's called the Refuel EU Aviation Initiative. It's part of the Fit for 55 uh, initiative to increase the uptake of greener fuels in aviation and also um, uh, marine sectors. And the same thing, the proposal aimed to support the increase um, in the demand for sustainable aviation fuel. So there's um, one thing that is uh, a little bit different. Um, from the US, they talk a lot about uh, conversion technologies, but they don't talk a lot about e-fuels. 
So uh, this is not part of their primary uh, way of converting, um, of creating those blue cells. The U, however, uh, is placing the E fuel right there on, on the objectives. Uh, anybody wants to make a guess on why? So they, uh, they don't have biomass, enough biomass, or, uh, no, yeah, uh, enough uh, renewable uh, bio feedstock uh, to, get, um, to get to what they, what they want to achieve with this. Yeah. Uh, the US, it turns out, is a big country. It's a big, empty country. Uh, and they made a ton of studies. Um, there's actually a, a study that's called the Billion Ton Report. Uh, they established that they can indeed get one billion dry ton of biomass a year uh, sustainably and without impacting the environment, the food network, and so on. So the, the US has the biomass, the Europe, uh, the uh, European Union uh, needs to be a bit more conservative on how they're using biomass. All right. So uh, if we want to talk about SAF, we probably want to uh, know what jet fuel is exactly. So uh, there's a bunch of data on that. Uh, Find the um, so what is jet fuel? Jet fuel is a type of fuel consumed in the US. Uh, so the third, uh, third one behind uh, diesel and gasoline. Gasoline is uh, way ahead. So it's a blended mixture of hundreds of hydrocarbon molecules ranging from eight to 16 carbon. And um, it's mostly, you can identify the molecules in three classes, alkane, isoalkane, cycloalkane, and aromatics. And those are uh, roughly distributed uh, along the carbon numbers with an average carbon number of, uh, of 12. So there's uh, a bit of um, uh, interesting uh, discussion to have about uh, jet fuel. If you look at the, um, your, uh, the right hand, come on. I didn't touch it. I promise I didn't touch it. All right, uh, so let's interpret this graph. Uh, so you have, uh, on one side you have the carbon numbers, this is the orange bar. Uh, on the other side you have the boiling points or the, uh, the, the range of temperature uh, for the distillation curve, the boiling curve uh, in, in blue. And the jet fuel is in the middle, it's a middle distillate. And what you see is that there's clear overlap uh, between the distillation curve of jet fuel and the distillation curve of, of diesel fuel. So. Um, if you want to, if you have a producer and you have a stream of material from which that covers everything, um, which one would you pick? If all outcome is equal, are equal? One of the extreme, because that's where you don't have to uh, skip the top and the bottom. So if there's no incentive to produce jet fuel, but there is some incentive to produce biodiesel, as it was the case. They would uh, produce the, uh, biodiesel. Uh, so the uh, initiatives about, um, about SAF, about uh, creating a demand for, uh, for jet fuel, is going to also uh, di um, displace a little bit the biodiesel production. All right, so uh, another way to look at uh, those things if you look at uh, jet fuel again, it's a mixture of alkane, isoalkane, aromatics, cycloalkanes. Um, and uh, what are those molecules actually doing in, in your fuel? So if you look at them per uh, category, the alkanes are really good in terms of specific energy, a bit less good in terms of energy density. They have great uh, thermal stability. But depending on uh, what kind of alkanes you have, sometimes the freezing point or the flash points of your fuel are not going to be what uh, it's supposed to be, if you're just looking at the alkane. If you mix it now with isoalkane, isoalkane uh, has also a very good specific energy, a bit uh, less energy density. Uh, thermal stability is great, uh, but it's red. Uh, but it's uh, going to compensate a little bit the alkanes in terms of freezing point and flash points. And you can do that for uh, all of the, the types. 
So the aromatics are a bit uh, different, less specific energy, more energy density. Um, but there's two things that uh, track out with the aromatics. The first one is obviously the sooting tendency. So if you have aromatics, you're going to create soot. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to do otherwise. Uh, but also, there is uh, a potential role of the aromatics uh, in terms of lubricants, and um, especially in the O-rings, uh, uh, the O-rings in, the, uh, in the, the gas turbine, uh, uh, making sure that the seals are, uh, are okay. So, on one side, they're great uh, because they help with the replication process and the, uh, the leaks and so on. On the other side, uh, the sooting tendency is terrible. And then uh, we have the, um, the cycloalkanes, and those group is uh, quite uh, diverse. So, but all over the, the place, it's mostly positive. So great energy density, great thermal stability, um, crystalline post flash point, okay. And uh, they found out that if you take uh, certain cycloalkanes, usually those with two rings, that, uh, two um, uh, saturated rings uh, fused together, uh, it has the potential to do the same thing as the aromatics, right? So your jet fuel is whatever it is coming from uh, crude oil, but now we are talking about uh, synthetic fuel. So when we look at this, then we can start uh, thinking, what should I optimize? If I want to get an even better fuel, uh, I should look at this map and, and, uh, and keep that in mind. Uh, one thing that I uh, didn't mention, so obviously the aromatics are limited, uh, but uh, one thing that is not allowed at all in jet fuel are olefin olefins and heteroradons. So you don't want oxygenates in your fuel, in your jet fuel. Uh, you don't want olefin in your, in your jet fuel, just because when you are on an aircraft, you want to make sure that nothing bad happens. So from safety reasons, uh, they really restrict on, on those things. All right, so uh, when you look at SAF, uh, uh, synthetic aviation fuel, I still don't know how to pronounce it, uh, we have a list of things that we want that fuel to, uh, to accomplish. So we have a list of performance properties, so clearly the associated with energy density, some stabilities, uh, and soothing. We have uh, a list of uh, performance that in terms of operability that we want the fuel to, uh, to match. The viscosity density, freeze point, flash point, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if we have all of them, then uh, we can play around with them. Uh, so we know that the gas turbine can operate with fuels that are way more energy dense than the current fuel that we're using. So if we can uh, increase that, that that's great. Um, so higher energy density, higher specific energy. And if we can fix this potential issue with the role of aromatics in the fuel line, uh, then we can also reduce the aromatics, and that would be absolutely great. So the one thing to keep in mind is that bulk properties like this are great, uh, but sometimes trace composition are also really, really important, especially in terms of engine material and component wear. So in terms of corrosion, lubricity, you want also to make sure that there's uh, no contaminant, no uh, small trace uh, material that would affect uh, the quality of your fuel. And of course, uh, the cost of your process is a big, big issue. You want it, you, you can afford a bit more than jet fuel, but not that much, not that much more. So how does the technical certification proceed? Um, so again, the key criteria for industry in this SAF adventure is uh, to create a SAF that can be dropped in, so directly uh, inserted into the jet fuel distribution system and uh, be done with it. Uh, and for now, uh, the, they only allow a maximum, so they're only gonna blend SAF with jet fuel uh, with a maximum of 50%. So uh, fuel certification is a long process, a very, very expensive process. Uh, so they made sure that it was ready for uh, SAF. So they created, uh, so there's a standard obviously for jet fuel. Uh, they created two standards, uh, one uh, that allows to uh, streamline the process for new SAF and the second one that actually defines what SAF should be. Uh, and you see the process over there, it goes through many, many uh, uh, boxes uh, from uh, simple specification properties all the way to a lot of tests to make sure that uh, everything's right. All right, so one thing that is great is that uh, one, uh, once a fuel, a SF, 
uh, has been certified uh, through this uh, standard, the, the last uh, DE7566, it can be requalified as conventional fuel so that it really, really becomes fungible with the jet fuel, uh, uh, jet fuel process. So there's no additional regulation, no additional paperwork, it's just part of the conventional fuel. So it makes things easy. And uh, there's, um, you would say that uh, uh, SAF is a new thing, but it's not a new thing. It turns out that people have been working on it quite a bit uh, for quite a long time. And there's already seven technology pathways that are uh, certified uh, for SAF productions. Uh, so I'm listing there here, uh, very, very small, uh, very small funds. Uh, so I kind of classified them a little bit uh, for you. So there's, uh, out, of the, out of the seven, there's uh, four that are really oil-based. So they come from, uh, some come from algae, uh, some come from uh, animal oil, yellow, brown, grease, uh, waste, energy oil. Um, and they have their own uh, way of getting processed uh, so that they can become uh, uh, a SAF. Oh, that's just this? Yeah, okay, so it was my fault. <laughs> I'm gonna try. And I was complaining that I was not touching anything and it was going away. Uh, all right, so that's four of them. Uh, another two are based on cellulosic biomass uh, and starch, uh, also from cellulosic biomass, uh, and uh, proceeds through fermentation and treatment, so what we call biochemical processes in order to create um, uh, SAF. And the last three uh, that I'm actually going to focus a bit more, uh, more on uh, are using a thermochemical process. So what is a thermochemical process? You're using heat uh, to do, uh, to convert your biomass. And what you do is you, um, uh, you get your biomass through a gasification process. You convert it into CO and H2. And then from that uh, syngas, then you fissure drop it into uh, the SAF of, of your choice. All right, so in the, uh, in the short term, when you look at all of those pathways, that are, um, that are approved up to a certain amount of uh, fraction in the jet fuel, uh, which one are the most robust one? Turns out it's the oil-based ones. Uh, they've been here for a long time. Uh, there's a lot of uh, crude material. Uh, so the US decided that uh, pre-2030, that's gonna be the main uh, source of uh, SAF um, while the other pathways are getting there. Uh, and in the longer term, uh, what they really want to do is expand uh, the uh, pathways that go through alcohol, waste-based, you know, cellulosic, and if you make an appearance here, capture carbon gas pathways. Um, and they're expecting that uh, in the next 10 years, new technologies are gonna be proposed and they're gonna work on them so that by 2050, we have a whole lot of technology available. All right, so I said I would, uh, uh, I would concentrate now uh, on thermochemical processes. So I'm gonna uh, switch gear, uh, not a little bit, uh, completely. So we looked at uh, why uh, we want to convert biomass to SAF. We know what SAF is, um, and we saw that uh, the one way that we know we can do it, we are allowed to do it, is through a gasification process. So now I want to take a step back, uh, look at my biomass, and I want that to be cellulosic biomass, cellul cellulolin, lignosic uh, biomass, so basically corn stover, uh, wood residues, agricultural residues, and so on. And I want to look at what options I have if I start now from the other side of the equation, if I start from the production side. Uh. All right, so just a, a brief overview. What can we do uh, with biomass if we're using uh, thermochemical conversion pathways. So again, we're using heat, and what we want to get out of it is a liquid directly or a gaseous fuel that uh, we can process into, um, into a synthetic fuel. If you uh, look at your biomass and you put it uh, in certain heat, but not, not too hot uh, and a very short time, what's gonna uh, happen is that, uh, and you remove oxygen, your biomass is gonna devitalize all the um, volatiles, all the carbons, uh, molecules, 
not, not all, but uh, some of the carbon molecules of your biomass are gonna be released to the gas phase. Uh, and those molecules, because the process is not that hot and the process is not that long, very short, uh, those molecules are kind of big. They uh, tend to condense out if you drop the temperature. So what you get out of it is mostly a liquid that has a whole lot of different molecules, and we're gonna talk about this, uh, a little bit of gas, uh, and uh, what remains for the biomass, which is basically carbon uh, that we call biochar. So again, uh, low temperature, very short reaction time. If you increase the, the temperature, if you increase the reaction time, then you're, you start with pyrolysis, and that's the same thing as in uh, combustion. When you, uh, uh, when you burn a fuel, you start with the pyrolysis process uh, if you're hot enough. So your uh, pyrolysis process produces uh, uh, molecules, big molecules, unstable molecules that are gonna crack in the, in the heat. So uh, instead of getting a liquid at the end, uh, if you have a little bit of oxygen, you can go all the way to syngas, H2 and CO. And depending on uh, your operation conditions, you can actually adjust a little bit your H2 to CO ratio. So that has to occur at higher temperature. And obviously, if you mix it with air and uh, push the temperature even higher, then you can get uh, biomass combustion, but we don't want to do that for now. We want to focus on pyrolysis and gasification so that we still have energy to, uh, to do um, something with. All right, so again, pyrolysis is a precursor of both gasification and combustion. Uh, and we are heating the material in the absence of oxygen to produce a volatile gases and carbon-rich solid residue. So, uh, now if I take my modeling hat and I want to understand the process from the modeling perspective, how do I do that? Complicated. Uh, and it's complicated for many, many reasons. Uh, the first one is a multi-component problem. What is biomass? And let's keep it simple, uh, a piece of wood. Uh, what, is, what is contained in a piece of wood? It's a linear cellulose biomass. Uh, it's, it's actually difficult to characterize. Uh, the main components, so it's a, it's a polymer. Uh, it's a mixture of three polymers, cellulose, hemicellulose, uh, lignin, uh, with a minor amount of water, alcohol, uh, minus, uh, minor amount of extractives that are uh, water or alcohol soluble. And the uh, one important thing, uh, mineral. So how much cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin you have in your biomass really depends on the type of biomass that you have. Uh, and type of biomass in the context of uh, biofuel uh, can go all the way from wood to, um, uh, to uh, grass to energy crops. Uh, all right, so let's start with, uh, with one of them. Let's start with cellulose. So what is cellulose? Uh, it's the one that is the most present in your biomass, 35 to 55 uh, percent in terms of weight. It's homogeneous uh, in the sense that it has one unit that gets repeated. Uh, so it's a linear polysaccharide uh, with a well-defined structure. So it's very long, um, long chains. The degree of polymerization, because again, it's, a, uh, it's one unit repeated, uh, connected on, on both sides become a polymer, so we characterize the length of the chain by the degree of polymerization, and um, it's about 10 to 15,000 of those units in uh, what we call the microfiber uh, fiber of, uh, of cellulose. All right, so what can you say about this cellulose? It's supposed to be, I mean, it, it's my biomass. At some point, it's gonna get converted into a fuel. Uh, immediately what should jump to you is the fact that it's full of oxygen. All right. Um, everybody. All right, so if I now move to hemicellulose, hemicellulose is the um, second most abundant uh, component, 20 to 35 weight percent of dry biomass. Again, that's an average. It can vary widely between uh, sources. Uh, it becomes a bit more complicated. Uh, what we have is not one unit that repeats it, uh, itself. We have plenty of them that can attach to each other in different ways. So when you look at the type of molecules that you end up, type of polymers that you end up uh, seeing, this is just one fragment of it, uh, but you start seeing long chain, but sometimes uh, sticks, uh, stuff sticking out. Uh, so it's a bit more uh, fuzzy in terms of uh, in terms of structure. 
uh, but it's a bit more compact, uh, 70 to 200 units in, um, in one, one unit, in one uh, molecule. And then we have lignin. Uh, so lignin is by far the most complex polymer, uh, but it has also, it's, uh, it's what gives rigidity to your plants. So it has uh, important structural functionalities. It reinforces the plant cell wall by bonding with cellulose. And uh, it enhances the waterproof nature of plant cell walls uh, because it's hydrophobic. And that allows the, the water to be um, transported in the capillaries. So uh, if you look at what lignin is made of, uh, it's mostly three monomers. And the one thing that, again, should uh, um, get your attention is the fact that those monomers contain aromatics. So it's the only component that has aromatics in it. Um, and those monomers can actually attach to each other in so many ways uh, to create really random structures. So uh, one example of it is, so this is just a, a structure of lignin fragments, so very hypothetical. We actually don't exactly know um, what uh, lignin looks like, uh, but uh, we know the monomers and we know that it can, um, can create a very big structure arranged in, in a random pattern. Um, so how do you, so if for the cellulose and the uh, hemicellulose, we knew that it would be roughly linear, but sometimes with uh, extra stuff, but mostly linear. Lignin is all over the place. How do you uh, model um, a structure like this? What kind of mechanism can you use? Or what kind of approach can you use? you can think of perhaps two of them. The first one is to average things out and have an average representative lignin uh, molecule. And what is the second one? Doing the exact opposite. It's going for stochastic and have a whole lot of different molecules that can be one representation of your lignin and you keep them uh, in your model. Uh, so using a statistical approach, a stochastic approach. And that's, uh, in the literature, you'll find uh, both, both approach. Either it's an average model or a statistical model. And in real life, uh, all those molecules assemble to actually create your, uh, your biomass. Uh, so you have a lot of cells, elongated cells, uh, that are connected to each other. And all of those are a mixture of cellulose encased in hemicellulose and lignin for rigidity. All right, so that's uh, the first of our problem, the fact that it's multi-component. The next one is, uh, again, with my modeling hat, uh, how do we model the chemistry? Once it starts paralyzing or gasifying, how do I keep track of the chemistry happening? So there's a kind of a simpler uh, version of what's happening uh, that we can um, uh, extract mostly from, uh, from intuition and from uh, looking at uh, what's happening in real systems. So you have your uh, biomass particles. It contains typically a bit of water. Uh, the first thing it's gonna do is dry. So you get uh, water out. And after that, it's gonna devolatilize. So if you go back to the type of molecules, uh, for example, this one, what you see is if it starts, so you are going to crack that at a uh, slightly high temperature. So there's two types of components that you can uh, see coming out of it. Uh, first, some small molecules that will be um, in the, uh, everything will be uh, gaseous, but those small molecules will not condense out if you drop the temperature, and you'll get larger fragments that will condense out and get you um, a liquid. And what remains after that is, is char. So that's uh, what you see coming out of your molecule. Uh, so those uh, heavy um, molecules are called tar, uh, permanent gases are permanent gases, they don't condense out, and uh, the remaining is, is char. But then, uh, this star is now uh, away from the molecule, and it's a, a hot environment, so some of the molecules will not survive and will uh, break down and go back to gas. Some will stay at, at the uh, condensable level, and you still get a bit more char coming, uh, coming in. So that's basically the uh, overall picture of what's happening with chemistry. How do we model that? So if you uh, 
look at your combustion background as reference. How, what kind of options do you have when you're facing this completely new system and you want a chemical model for it? What if we keep it super simple? What would you do? If you need a combustion model and you want it to be super simple, what do you use? The most simplest ones. One equation, global equations, right? A global model that doesn't give you a lot of, uh, a lot of information, but at least it's there. It's easy to use, not really accurate, uh, but it kind of represents what's going on in very broad uh, strokes. And uh, from the uh, biomass perspective, that's exactly what happened. We tried first to uh, do it as simple as possible. So that's the simplest one uh, that you can find, single component, single stage, biomass going to, to gas, tar, and char. Uh, with the reaction rates based on the single activation energy and your only variable that you're solving for is the uh, mass conversion, so how much biomass has been uh, reacted. Uh, what is the problem with those, those type of models, especially in the context of biomass? Single free parameter, so you're gonna you're gonna give that model to somebody, they're gonna say, oh, the activation energy is that amount of uh, take help more. Then you give it to somebody else, slightly different biomass, slightly different configuration. Then, oh no, that's at least twice as much. So you get a wide range of uh, activation energy values, uh, and at best, what you can expect is uh, to get the mass loss curve. So how biomass is uh, being degraded over time. So that's not, uh, so it's really simple, but it's not really accurate. The next step that has been extremely popular and is actually coming from a combustion person uh, has been to realize that we can do better uh, because, I mean, in combustion we have, uh, uh, we have better approaches. Uh, so it actually comes from Joseph Bellon from 97, uh, so that's 26 years ago. Um, he proposed the following, uh, so it was Miller and Bellon, uh, they proposed the following um, Approach, so first, you want to distinguish between cellulose, uh, lignin, and hemicellulose because clearly those are not the same molecules. Clearly they are not reacting the same way. Uh, so you have one set of reactions per component. Um, and then uh, you want to distinguish between the products that you get in a way that is a bit more realistic. So instead of having just tar, char, and, and gas, uh, you look at where exactly tar and gas are coming from and you try to make sure that the outcome is uh, a bit more flexible. And then you look at actual data and you realize that you're missing something and uh, what's missing is uh, an extra step to delay the process. So they introduce the concept of active biomass. So something that is here that is just about to react, but it takes a bit of time, a bit of delay, so that you can recover the right uh, dynamics. And with uh, this very simple model, you can actually do quite, uh, uh, quite a lot. So uh, on one side you have the mass of uh, various components as a function of time. Uh, I think it was uh, Beechwood. Um, so the type of experiments that you can do for this, it's, you're not gonna put, you're not gonna look at an entire reactor and, and uh, look at the full process. What you do is take a very small particle, put it in a very small plate, and use thermogravimetric analysis on it. So heat up very slowly and look at, uh, so have a scale on your, your particle and look how the mass uh, varies. And then you can recover the products and you can uh, quantify the tar and the gas coming out of it and, and the char. And this model, uh, even if, so there's a bit more uh, free parameters, it requires obviously a bit of tuning, but um, the heat of reactions is pretty fixed. Uh, they, they had a lot of success with this. And this probably has been the most uh, used biomass model um, in the community. But that's not much, right? Coming from combustion, that's, uh, that's very limited. So what's the next step? And I heard it before. So you don't want the global model, but you're really not ready to look at the details of it. What can you do? It's like you have this transportation fuel, hundreds of components. You don't want to look at the, the details of it. 
the surrogate and you try to lump things as much as possible, right? So um, as a surrogate, uh, surrogate fuel or a high chem type version of, uh, of your process. And that's, um, that was provided by the uh, Milano group, uh, Rancy et al, uh, from 2008, so not that long ago, uh, where they did exactly this. Uh, you know we have different components. Uh, we know that lignin is really weird, uh, so we probably want to account for the fact that there's various monomers in it. But then what we really want to, to know is what's coming out of your, um, of your biomass so that we can quantify what is in that product. Because at the end, if you want to do modeling, of a biomass conversion reactor, you want to be able to predict what kind of bio oil or what kind of um, pollutant you're gonna get in your syngas. So they, they designed this uh, uh, semi-detailed lumped model. So it provides the yields and lump composition of gas, tar, and solid residues. And you can see uh, now in the name of the, uh, of the products, uh, things that you start recognizing. So for example, phenol is one. We know what phenol is. And all of a sudden, that becomes an input to a mechanism that we know. We know how phenol reacts in uh, pyrolysis type conditions. We have data for it because we work in combustion. Um, and it turns out that all the other products, chromaryl, uh, glycolaldehyde, levoclucosan, are all molecules that look a bit weird, but we know how to deal with them. So we... Um, we actually dealt with the complicated biomass parts and we're ready to actually bring our combustion experience uh, and, and finish the, the model and get an actual answer at the end. Uh, so for the first kind, uh, for the first, uh, so the first of the kind, um, and we can follow the fate of the primary products in the gas phase. And all of a sudden, that got people interested in quantifying what exactly is in the output stream. So we started doing a uh, comparison between actual species, um, species component. So the top one is levoglucosan. Levoglucosan is the uh, main product of um, uh, cellulose decomposition. We have hydrometyl furfural. Uh, this should start ringing a bell. Uh, there's been a lot of work on furfuran. Um, uh, hydroxyacetaldehyde at the, at the bottom. So all of those are now something that we can, as combustionists, uh, recognize. And we can start having data. Uh, so there's some degree of freedom to describe the different feedstock. Uh, so we can now play around with how much cellulose and lignin and, and hemicellulose uh, the, the, the molecules have. So that's, uh, that was a great, uh, great way forward. It was improved, revised later on uh, to account for various things that were not in the initial model. But we were uh, ready to do actual chemistry. And then, uh, about 10 years ago, somebody did it. Somebody look at those massive molecules, those polymers, and created models for it, detailed um, uh, mechanistic model for it. So there's uh, one main source, it's Dr. Broadbelt. Uh, she went through all the components and in isolation, but also in their native environment, meaning uh, as they are constrained by the other components, and created uh, um, an actual detailed model, the chemical model, the, the way that combustionists would, uh, would understand it. Uh, there's, uh, there's been since then uh, somebody else uh, doing it, so there's, uh, it's uh, created more and more of those models. All right, so I'm citing two. Uh, one for biomass paralysis and gasification uh, that was uh, obtained using automatic type uh, network generation and the one from Dr. Broadbelt uh, based on experiment in quantum chemistry. And that looks ugly, like really, really ugly. Um, because obviously you're starting from uh, a polymer that has many, many uh, different things, so you end up with hundreds of species. Back to the problem of combustion and back to the problem of how do we deal with that. Um, the, uh, Uh, actually, the, the interesting, interesting things about this mechanism is uh, it differs a little bit from, um, uh, from a combustion application, usual applications, because you remember how I told you that for lignin, how you have either an average molecule or you have 100 samples of what the molecule could look like. They actually went the 100 sample of molecule, uh, how the molecule would look like, uh, and they created their integrator to account for this. 
So uh, what they have is statistics on what type of uh, composition they, they, would, uh, they should have. And they have models, they have experiments, it compares uh, really well. Uh, so that's the first of the kind of actually uh, modeling those, uh, this crazy molecule. All right, and then they didn't stop here. Uh, in the biomass community, so biomass paralysis. Uh, so biomass paralysis is a, a strange field because it comes and goes, at least it used to do that. So it was very active 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, and then it was again very active in early 2000, but then it dies down, uh, and then now it's starting to go back up. It's usually associated with the price of oil or the uh, availability of other uh, resources. Uh, but there's also um, uh, uh, um, a loss of knowledge as those things come and go. So what we have uh, from all those years of experience is a lot of data, a lot of data that are really, really heterogeneous. They are coming from different groups with different standards. Uh, but when you look at all those things, uh, you realize there's one thing true. Uh, the biomass contains minerals in it, and the minerals do have an impact, a, a very big impact. Uh, and what uh, they did in their uh, model is they added trace minerals on the, um, on the kinetics. So now we have a model that actually can potentially help us understand what's going on with biomass. All right, so that was uh, paralysis. So again, we are just looking at uh, the, uh, the initial steps. Uh, now let's look at gasification, because gasification, you remember, was the one process certified for SAF uh, production. So what's happened during gasification? So we start with biomass the same way. Uh, there's no oxygen, it's hot. So what's gonna happen is you, you have uh, what we call those parameters, those big molecules coming out of your, your biomass. Uh, and that would be the paralysis process. But then we don't stop here because we still, uh, we have our resistance time a bit higher, temperature is that, uh, a bit higher, so we have thermal cracking uh, going on. And what's gonna happen is all the oxygen contained in those uh, molecules are gonna go away. And most of those, those cracking is largely unimolecular until you have small hydrocarbons, radicals, and then uh, what happens are two things. Uh, most of it goes to CO and H2, but depending on your reactor condition, some of them might recombine and start uh, growing in, in, in the form of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And those are really uh, annoying to, to deal with. You need to have a scrubber, you need to uh, clean your, your syngas before you can actually go to the fissure trop process and, and continue. Uh, so that's a broad view of uh, the gasification model. Again, this one is slightly easier to model. Uh, once we have the paralysis part, then it looks like something that we know. Different, slightly different conditions, but uh, we're more familiar with it. All right, uh, question for you, because you're getting uh, sleepy. The, uh, I mentioned that there's uh, seven technology pathways that uh, are certified for SAF production. There is one of them that was not in it. It was the uh, paralysis process. So all the thermochemical process in the approved list went all the way to gasification and then fissure trope. Um, the one that, didn't, uh, that has not been approved yet uh, is the paralysis one. So instead of going all the way to gasification, you stop before and you get a bio oil. Do you have any idea why that would be? Why there still need to be more work to do? Look at those molecules, they're really nasty. They are full of oxygen. They might have trace components of minerals that act as catalyst. Bio oil is the worst thing ever. Uh, it looks like a tarry thing. Uh, it's acidic, it's corrosive. So you don't want to deal with it without actually converting it to something else. And the converting it to something else uh, is not uh, mature enough to be a candidate for SAF certification, obviously. But uh, hopefully this, uh, this would come. Uh, all right. You know uh, what kind of reactor is used for biomass gasification and paralysis? How do we get pieces of words to actually react and get us fuel? It's actually done with food as beds. So, 
don't laugh. Uh, those are simulations uh, that I did a long time ago. Uh, so they're not the, the <laughs> they're not the most uh, exciting, but at least it uh, provides a view of what um, a fluter's bed is. So a fluter's bed is basically a cylinder where you have a bed of sand and you inject uh, gas uh, at the temperature that you want, uh, and that makes the sand bubble and behaves uh, like a fluid. So you can actually simulate that. It actually really look like um, uh, like a liquid bubbling, and that's how you establish very good um, uh, heat uh, heat transfer to your biomass particles, homogeneous conditions, so that the biomass particles stay in the bed and their um, their gases escape. If you want. Uh, Not sure if the other one is okay. One, two. Oh, it was the same same thing, uh, but uh, zoomed in. I'll see if I can make it work later. All right. So what we are looking at is a free death bed reactor. So again, we have nailed down the chemistry. And now we need to nail down the entire reactor. Uh, because just like combustion, if you have the kinetics, you definitely don't have the reactor. Uh, you don't have the flames. There's clearly some transport and, and, and stuff happening. So um, let's look at it. Uh, let's look at the problem from the biomass pers perspective. And that's also a challenge. It's really multi-scale, multi-physics. So on the molecular scale, we start with the chemistry that we just uh, talked about. So we saw the molecular scale. The chemistry actually happened, uh, but eventually what we want is something to, um, to inform industry. So we want 1D engineering models, we want plant models, we want stuff that industry can use. So along the way, uh, we realized that there's a lot of processes that are added. Uh, one that uh, I, I really like, I mean, when, you buy, uh, when you gasify very small particles, sorry, I touched my screen. That was not enough. So biomass itself, when you look at a piece of wood, it seems solid. Uh, but when it's subjected to high temperature and starts to uh, convert into uh, other stuff, it actually becomes really uh, flexible. And uh, depending on where the products are coming from, uh, you can have release of gases inside the walls of your uh, of your biomass, so your uh, your walls, cell walls are going to balloon. Uh, your biomass particles is going to grow, and all of a sudden it will uh, it will shrink. So there's a lot of dynamics uh, in the nature of the matrix that uh, that's happening. So obviously uh, this is less obvious when you're talking about uh, larger pieces of um, of biomass, but uh, most of the time we don't ground the biomass that fine. In a biomass reactor, we just put uh, pieces that can be uh, small, but they have uh, they still have uh, they have a length. Uh, so we have to couple the surrounding gas flow with what happens to the biomass. In this case, shrinking breakage uh, can happen. Uh, from the modeling perspective, when we start looking at fluid as bed reactor and we start looking at what's happening at the size of the particles, then we need to look at how the flow uh, interacts with the particles, and we need to really resolve uh, resolve this. So if we uh, want to focus on, uh, we'll have uh, certain types of simulations to do. When we um, move up in, uh, in size, uh, what we have is what's called the mesoscale. Uh, scale. mesoscale. Um, and those are the scale of the bubbles that you're going to get in your fluid as bed. And it turns out that uh, so there's different uh, fluid as beds, some where the uh, gas is not going too fast inside your bed, so most of the sand stays at the, at the bottom. Uh, but if you start increasing the velocity of your, uh, of your air, of your uh, medium, through the, um, through the reactor, you are going to create, uh, you are going to uh, blow your particles uh, up. And uh, if you continue doing that, you're going to get what we call a riser reactor. So particles now are pushed up uh, throughout the reactor. And if you were expecting that everything was homogeneous and nice for the biomass particles, uh, think again, because it's actually not the case at all. Uh, what we see is a lot of heterogeneity in how the particles are distributed in the, in the reactor. So that's at the mesoscale, but uh, so that's um, one type of, uh, of 
here we can look at from the modeling perspective. Uh, but after that, we want to reach the uh, reactor size itself, so the macro scale. We want to uh, skip the, the bubbles. We want to look at the entire thing uh, and be in a position to actually look at the heterogeneity and the effect on the process. And then reach the plan scale, much, much bigger uh, 10, 10 meters uh, type uh, model. And that's where we need also uh, appropriate tools to actually look at what's happening at uh, those large scales. So if I uh, really look at the computational point of view, so now I'm switching to CFD. I did the chemistry, now I move to CFD. What we are solving really is the Navier-Stokes equations, no, nothing else. Uh, with a set of initial conditions and with specified time space varying binary conditions, uh, with the chemistry that is still here uh, taken into account through equations for chemical variables. So it turns out that if we want to look at different processes, either at the particle scale or the bubble scale or the actual reactor scale, the type of tools that we need are going to be very different uh, because the methods that we're going to use to look at very small scale are going to be very complicated to use and computationally prohibitive uh, at the larger scale. So that's where modeling comes into play and we'll have different strategies to handle those things. So, uh, and that's, um, if you want an analogy with combustion, uh, that's also what's happening when you go from uh, resolving neatly your laminar flame front for a 1D laminar flame and uh, going all the way to a massive reactor gas turbine uh, where you need to actually switch to way more uh, efficient techniques, uh, rents or, or something. So uh, again, the way we handle the uh, multi-phase aspect is different. The way we are going to handle the chemistry is also different, the same way as for combustion we need uh, chemical models uh, to integrate them with, um, with the flow. The same exists for um, uh, for biomass or for particle reactors. So we go from really resolved simulation, the equivalent of DNS, to something that is half resolved, so we are, uh, you can kind of compare it to an LES, uh, and then at the very large scale, uh, you need to, um, to remove the details, uh, and you're not considering the particles anymore, you're just considering the volume fraction of the particles. So that way you are, uh, saving on your computational costs and you can achieve larger scales. So, uh, the issue with those techniques, they're, when you write them down, they're great, but just like LES and, uh, and RANS in, in combustion, as soon as you start making assumptions or averaging or filtering your equations, what you are going to end up with are uh, small scales that are not captured. So for LES, you are going to filter your large scale. Uh, the small scale motions are, need to be accounted for, but they're not in the equations anymore. So you need closure models. You need to add something to represent the effect of the small scales on your, on your flow. Uh, that's exactly the same thing for particles reactors. You need, you're not resolving the particles, and uh, they're, they're way below the cell size but you still need to know exactly what they are doing to the flow. So you need to uh, come up with subgrid uh, effects. You need closures. And that uh, is true for the drag models, so how much momentum is exchanged between the particle phase and the flow phase, but also with the uh, chemical source term. How do you deal with the fact that you started with the particles and it's now so small that you, you need to capture what's happening inside the particles at a much larger scale? So again, you need uh, closure models. And the best scale to do it is this middle scale, obviously, because it's not that expensive, it's not that big, um, and you can resolve a lot of things. So you can, again, uh, if you want um, an analogy with the combustion world, is finding the uh, scale at which you can do a DNS and also an LES, and that's where you can compare your, your closure model. That's the same type of ideas. Uh, all right, uh, I'm gonna, I don't know how much. You want 20 more minutes? Uh, I was gonna talk about uh, inhomogeneities and why is it, uh, why it is important. I, I can go fast. Um, so I mentioned the fact that inside your reactor, nothing is homogeneous. You have a lot of um, structures 
And it turns out that uh, those structures definitely affect your flow. So you cannot, in the same way as uh, when you're looking at a combustion problem, you cannot just look at the chemistry and completely forget about the flow. The flow will impact how the chemistry proceeds. In those reactors, uh, it's exactly the same thing. The flow and how the particles move around are going to affect uh, how your chemistry is going to proceed. In a way that is slightly different, um, uh, and it comes uh, mostly from inhomogeneities. So when you look at um, All right, so here I'm looking at what we call a riser reactor, so, um, but I'm making it periodic. So instead of having the particles moving up, it feels like they're, they're coming down just because of the reference frame that is kind of screwed up. Uh, but I'm looking at uh, a representation of what's happening in the middle of that reactor. And I started with my particles that were neatly homogeneously uh, distributed in my reactor. So my reactions, my biomass was happy, and, and um, so in this case, it's not biomass, it's uh, catalytic upgrading. So it's just a gas that uh, needs to be in contact with the particles to actually react, so it's a slightly different process. Um, so if the gas gets in contact with the same amount of particle over time, uh, you'll get the same answer everywhere, everything is homogeneous. Uh, but it turns out that the particles have a mind of their own, and they are not staying uh, neatly distributed in the middle of the cylinder. What do you see? They tend to aggregate on the side. And they tend to form what we call clusters. So they, they're, uh, they're falling, in this case, they're falling in, in the form of packets. So if now you are uh, your, the, the gas phase and you want to touch your catalytic particles in order to react, uh, and you have the, uh, you're not as lucky and you're going through the center line of your reactor, what's going to happen is that you're not going to see the, catal uh, the catalyst and you're gonna, not going to react. So instead of having a neatly converted product at the end, what you're going to get is a mixture of reacted products and unreacted products. So the dynamics of the reactor definitely um, impact the, the solution. Um, and that's uh, quantification of that process. So uh, we are looking at this time we are... Um, uh, injecting or uh, reactants here, and again, they need to touch catalytic particles in order to react, uh, and we are collecting the uh, composition at the end of the reactors, and it's a super simple uh, reaction. We say that our volatiles or particles that need to react uh, touch the, catalyt the catalyst and uh, become gas and hydrocarbon, so we are just uh, cracking our volatile uh, particles using the catalyst. So very simple 1D uh, first order reaction. So what we see is uh, that at the end of my uh, simulation, instead of having reacted everything, I have a 69% conversion rate. So I started with 100% volatile. At the end of my reactor, I have 69%. Uh, and that's because I uh, simulated the whole thing. Now, what would an industry person do? They would see the amount of catalyst. They would see the amount of volatiles that you have. They would see the reaction rate. They would do potentially a 1D model, just uh, your volatile encountering catalyst over that time frame, uh, and they would just average everything out. If you do that, uh, your predictions are going to be very, very off. So if you look at the blue line, is if you assume that everything, uh, the particles were neatly, uh, homogeneously um, distributed, you would get uh, less, a 20% higher conversion rate, but because of the dynamics of the, the particles, you get a much lower conversion rate. So this is just to illustrate that the dynamics of the reactor actually do matter. Uh, they're gonna affect your chemistry in various ways, same way as uh, with combustion systems. Uh, so if you want to progress in modeling of the systems, uh, it goes through both the chemistry and uh, the, the flow in transport. All right, so just to finish, uh, a couple of questions, a few questions. Uh, why should we care about, 
about uh, the developing fancy model for biomass conversion reactor. Uh, it turns out that until recently, the biomass industry couldn't care less. Uh, fancy models were not what they were uh, really interested in because their issues were not optimization of the process. It was just making the process work. Uh, so they were really far removed from the type of consideration that a detailed model would provide. Uh, but it turns out that things are changing because uh, now we are, there's a, a lot more um, attention placed on biofuel production, uh, especially with, uh, with SAF, uh, and we are starting to see the limitations of what we have. Uh, so what would an industry uh, person do if they see that the thing is not reacted enough? they would just add more catalysts. So that's more cost, then you need to recover the catalyst and that's even more cost. Uh, at some point, it has to become um, a competitive process. So there's some sort of optimization that has to be done. And uh, especially when we're looking at biomass and how uh, viable it is from bio, uh, biofeedstock to biofeedstock, um, I feel that fancy models are gonna be useful at some point. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, industry needs. The next step, the, the next thing is um, we have no idea what's happening inside the reactor because optical diagnostics definitely do not work uh, inside those very opaque thing. Uh, so it's very, very difficult to understand how uh, trace amount of molecules or, or stuff in the biomass and within this very dynamical system are gonna create very, very different results. And the models are now at a point where they can start answering those questions for us. It was not necessarily the case 20 years ago, but because of recent progress, um, it, uh, it, it clearly is getting there. Uh, so where progress can be made in terms of modeling those things, uh, it turns out that uh, biofuel production and combustion people usually did not really hang around. Um, and uh, two anecdotal evidence for this. Uh, combustion is clearly, uh, especially in the US, a mechanical engineering uh, topic. So uh, combustion is squarely inside mechanical engineering departments, uh, mostly everywhere. Uh, biofuel production, definitely chemical engineering. And there's not a lot of opportunities for chemical engineers and uh, mechanical engineers to interact. So there's been this parallel track between uh, the user of the fuel and the developer of the fuel, uh, where they were, they were not really talking to each other, but that's starting, uh, that's really started to change um, uh, recently. Uh, there's also a lot of progress made in numerical methods, in uh, development of computers, supercomputers, uh, and uh, the detailed chemistry, and I mentioned it. And then uh, just like for combustion, when you're looking at your model for transportation fuel, it has 100 components and it's not even the start of it and you have a very big reactor, uh, it feels like the system is so complex that modeling isn't even worth it. Uh, but it's changing, there's progress. Uh, and the fact that, um, especially on the biomass side, it really felt hopeless a few years ago uh, but the better integration of fuel combustion and fuel production uh, allows this transfer of knowledge between the two fields that make things progress much faster than they, they used to. Uh, so it's, uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's hopeless. I, I think those, um, those models are gonna have a future and are going to progress and be used. All right, I'll stop here. It's a boring year. Thank you, Perrin. Excellent lecture. That was really great. Any question for Perrin? I know that we have chemical engineer and chemist in the in the room, so please, this is your opportunity. So, commission here is in chemical engineering. No. Mechanical engineering. Chemical engineering. Yes. Can you say? It? Uh, Professor Perrin, thank you for a very interesting and uh, informative lecture. I just have a few couple questions. Uh, the first one is uh, about the uh, first part where you introduced the production of uh, SAF. So you mentioned that uh, the presence of uh, oxy oxygenated species adversely affects the production. I um, was just wondering if you can elaborate more on that. So the standards for jet fuel do not allow for oxygen in this. Hmm. That's it. Oh, so it's just a matter of regulation? 
it's regulation. Um, so so uh, when you have oxygen inside the fuel, uh, oxygen is typically reactive. So you have properties associated with the fuel that might not be beneficial for the long-term thermal stability and, um, uh, and uh, health of your, your lines and system. So they don't allow oxygen. Oh, if they allow ox oxygen, there's always oxygen a little bit, uh, but in very minute amount. Okay, thank you. And my other question is um, about the um, aromatics content of these fuels. So typically one of the common challenges with uh, these pathways is um, you don't have sufficient aromatic content, which causes some issues with the O-ring swelling, as you mentioned. But when you introduce the uh, composition of these biomass uh, sources, um, I noticed that the uh, lignin type um, has a lot of uh, aromatic content. So would it be possible to target certain biomass species or separate and s through some process the, uh, the lignin such that we can promote the aromatic content? So um, we know how to produce aromatics. That's not the problem. What we would love to not have in our fuel is aromatics. They're here because they're coming from uh, crude oil and in the distillation process, a certain part of aromatics uh, made their way inside the, the jet fuel. And they play a role. They play a role in terms of um, ignition capabilities, uh, you know, ignition sensitivities and, and thermal energy and so on. Um, but aromatics are really not what we want because they create soot. Exactly, yeah, but Sorry to interrupt, but in my understanding, I thought that they also served a crucial role when it comes so, to the So they, uh, there's evidence that is, uh, depending on who you talk to, um, it might be useful. Yeah, you, you want them uh, for, cer for certain lubricating aspects. Exactly. Um, what uh, they started to realize is certain cycloalkanes might be able to play the same role. And cycloalkanes are much better. They're saturated. There's no aromatic rings, so they don't immediately start uh, growing pHs um, after them. So the idea would be to manipulate how you create those saps to replace the aromatics by cyclo, um, cycloalkanes. Right. That's part of how do you optimize your fuel in order to be even more efficient while keeping exactly the same specification for your jet fuel. Right. Very interesting. Thank you. Other question? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the great lecture. I found it really interesting when we were talking about uh, SAV. So I don't know if you know about the, uh, there is a really huge uh, project in UK and actually, Saudi Arabia is part of that uh, El Fanaro group working with the uh, tea side uh, in the UK, where they have a, a big uh, portion of the uh, carbon capture um, unit over there. So I think uh, they're producing like almost like uh, 48 billion uh, gallon of um, SAF every year of that project. So my question here is, uh, you were highlighting that, you know, the feedstock of the SAF would be different from uh, region to region, depending on the feedstock or the natural sources they have in that area. So uh, what would you say about like the most common uh, SAF resources would be as a natural? Is it like carbon capture? Is it uh, solar? Is it wind? Uh, and if we can differentiate the SAF based on the feedstock that's coming from. So the, the goal is really to have SAF that are fungible. So regardless of how they are created, uh, if they are certified, if they follow STM standard, it means that they will have the same properties. Same way as jet fuel can come from crude oil from Alberta or uh, from Saudi Arabia. And those will be very, very different uh, in nature. They will be reflected by difference in the molecules in your jet fuel. But overall, when you mix everything, you're gonna get the same, uh, the same behavior. So um, everybody will want to contribute to the SAF production and they will want to contribute based on what uh, they have. So um, I was not necessarily saying that uh, e-fuel would not be uh, covered in the US. Uh, I'm just saying that right now they specifically focus on oil uh, and grease and, and uh, waste uh, 
um, um, oily uh, stuff because that's what they have to work with and it's better to use them to do SAF than to dump them in the... So, um, I was not aware of the UK, so I, I follow the news in Europe just based on what uh, uh, gets to the US. Uh, so sometimes not everything gets, uh, gets to the US. So thank you for, for letting me know that there's also... A... And maybe one more question since we touched bases on the regulation regarding SAF. Uh, so you have highlighted that, you know, the uh, blending ratio so far is like the maximum they can go is 50% uh, jet fuel and SAP. So what is the current uh, blending that you guys are working on? So every process has um, a maximum, uh, their, their, uh, the specification, the ASTM tells them how much they can actually achieve. And it's not 50%. Uh, for a lot of them, it's like 5%. Um, and the, the goal is to remove the barrier uh, that prevents them to mix more. So by 2050, uh, they want to have removed this 50% barrier and just use that. Because that's what they're hoping for. Thank you very much. Any other question? Yeah, here. Uh, first of all, thank you for the informative presentation. Uh, you mentioned that there is progress that can be made when, uh, in collaboration between combustion and mechanical engineering departments and uh, production with chemical engineers. Can you name a few areas of collaboration that mechanical engineers can um, approach chemical engineers to collaborate on regarding this field? So um, I think my, my comment was chemical engineers and biological and environmental engineering. So there's... Uh, Depending on where you are, that can be chemical engineers or that can be uh, different things. Uh, one thing that I noticed is, uh, for example, the, the standardization. So, uh, and, and that depend, obviously depends on the field and, uh, and the tradition of the field. Uh, when you look at combustion from the mechanical engineering point of view, everything, there's a way to report conditions of an experiment. Uh, and I, <laughs> So I will, don't, don't take it personally, uh, but when I read a paper from a chemical engineer, typically they're gonna say, oh, the volume flow rate is one liter standard. And then I'm asking, what is standard? And then I go to the internet and I look at standard and then I have two, three different temperatures that could apply to that specific things. Uh, so that's one, <laughs> one very small example um, uh, of, people not speaking the same language. So obviously for a chemical engineer, everything is clear and there's, there's no problem about determination of what has been done. Uh, but uh, because there's a slight language uh, barrier, then this uh, information is not, um, not transferred. The, the other uh, aspect is in terms of modeling. So chemical engineers uh, tend to be more process oriented. So they have a more global, um, way of interpreting those things, especially in the biomass um, area. Uh, mechan engin mechanical engineers are less system-wide. Uh, they are more detailed-oriented. Uh, so that provides two different views that are very valuable, one and the other. So if they could actually uh, consider it together, then that's this added information that you can extract from it. So that's what I meant by uh, talking to each other different ways of looking at things that just add to the knowledge. That's great. Thank you for the insight. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. This is not specifically my area of expertise, but that is something that I want to ask you about. Is it possible if it's uh, available for the staff to inject it into the liquid of the electrolyte inside of the, the battery? So make it the staff, uh, the energy storage is the battery. So we could apply the battery in the plane and also make it uh, more rechargeable, for example. So SAFs are not made for this uh, because I don't think there's fuel cells that operate on jet fuel. I don't think they, they would survive long because of the, the, the uh, but um, the great uh, thing about synthetic fuel is that you can synthesize whatever you need for your fuel cells. Um, and uh, so 
So I don't know, it's not my area, so I don't know the standards and what they, uh, they can achieve right now, but uh, for example, the, um, uh, the engine that's gonna go on this A380 to test, uh, to test zero, net, net zero emissions for, for aviation fuel is a fuel cell uh, working on hydrogen, right? And this hydrogen is also coming potentially from synthetic fuel, like uh, um, the gasification process, for example. Thank you. Just to tease a little bit, tomorrow we will have a talk about fuel cells. So see if you are interested in fuel yeah. cells. They are experts. They are experts in the room. <laughs> Don't talk to me. <laughs> talk to them. <laughs> Any other question? Okay, so Perrine will be here uh, still um, until tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow evening. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, talk to her. So thank you very much for the great talk. Thank you.